Hello, this is Sarah Hawkins, the gallery assistant of Northwest Florida State College's Maddie Kelly Art Center Art Galleries. Today, Margaret Schnebley Hodge here is with us to discuss her current exhibition, Breaking Free, Dark Energy, Dark Matter. And in just a moment, the camera will give her, give it focus on her. And as you watch, just show us your enthusiasm. Give us lots of hearts, leave comments, ask questions. Because at the end of the gallery talk, we'll be asking the questions you've submitted on our questionnaire and throughout the live feed. Now let's join this in the discussion with Margaret Schnebley Hodge and the gallery director, Casey Williams. All right, so thank you all for being here. Those who don't know me, I'm the gallery director here. Welcome to our viewers who are joining us on Periscope. Hope there are a lot of you. Um, and I'm really happy today to present to you Margaret Schnebley Hodge, Hodge, our exhibiting artist. The show Breaking Free, Dark Energy, Dark Matter. It's one that I was excited to bring here, partially because of how beautifully, as you can see, it works in our space. The, uh, the, the colors and the scale is sort of a perfect reflection um, of, of what, this, what this gallery can hold, what it can support, what it can show off. And so um, I think she's going to have a lot of really interesting things to say to you here about, about her work, her practice as an artist, um, and the discussion, because I know there's some things you're probably interested in, whether you're an artist or you're just a student of the arts in other ways. So, take it away, Margaret. Let's give her a hand. up the work. It was a real treat that you know in Daytona I picked up the work and Sarah for all her help in getting the work installed. I have to also say my husband uh, delightfully calls himself an art mule because he totes my work around for me and helps me install it. So uh, for those of you who do have a partner, hopefully you'll have one that works as hard as he does um, and is supportive. You know, that's important. I'm here today, I guess, because Number one, they said I needed to be here. <laughs> but number two, mostly because I love talking to people about art. And I was, uh, like you, I went to uh, Daytona State College and wasn't really, and I don't know about if you have plans or not, but I really didn't have a plan. I just knew that I was uh, pretty good at art. I had always been an artist. Uh, from elementary school on up, I was the class artist. They kept telling me I was an artist. So eventually, that's what I, I went into. Um, now, this is fine arts, and this is separate from what I came out of college. I went to the University of Florida after I finished at Daytona State College. I graduated in the graphic arts, and I still today somewhat separate those two. I have a graphic arts style life, and I have my fine arts life that I maintain. So when I... Um, began my careers outside, I worked at a variety of things, and I love to look back on that history now because it gave me everything that I have today to work with. And I started out uh, at da in Daytona Beach, I came back home, and there's not a whole lot in Daytona Beach, you know, you're not in New York City where there's a bunch of advertising agencies, you're not in a big metropolitan. But what I did was I started working at a sign company, that was my first job, I learned how to do electronic and and uh, billboards for advertising. And I moved on from that. Um, I actually started painting signs, right? It was my side gig. And then I went on to doing art directors for um, national publications and newspapers, etc. I went into the advertising and marketing. Then I went caught up into government doing public information for the community. That's how my career, my paid career worked, right? Um, I'm currently still working for county government. I celebrate 30 years. They, it's a, it's a, been a wonderful trip through government. I want to tell, share that with y'all because a lot of people wouldn't think of government as being a potential area where you might work. But I started out in the community information department doing the graphic arts and doing illustrations, by the way. You know, I introduced to government a whole different look at how they should look. I went on to uh, implement recycling programs when they first got started, and I was traveling around the state designing, again, brochures and public information materials, uh, all the while still doing painting. And at the time, I was painting landscapes and portraits, right? 
So I, I guess what I want to say mostly about my story is that it changed and evolved. I never really had myself stuck in such a game plan that I couldn't expand and grow and learn from everything that I did along the way. And everything can be creative. So now, working at county government, going back to that story a little bit, I was chosen to do what's called the ECHO Grants Program, which is a multi-million dollar program to develop environmental, cultural, historical, outdoor recreation programming. Often what they said to me, and I, and I sent an uh, article from Forbes to Casey earlier this morning, they said to me, Margaret, you have a different way of looking at things. So I would sit and I would say, I'd be into these government meetings and I would say something and the whole room would get quiet, right? Because they weren't quite sure where I was coming from. But today I live off of that. The fact that I look at things differently and I think everyone who's in the art world should start thinking outside of even their box and think that wherever, whatever job you end up with, it's not forever, it doesn't have to be forever, but make it as creative an opportunity as you can make out of it, you know? And that's all I can say. I didn't set out to do one thing, and thank goodness I didn't, because it's been really a lot of joy. Now, so that's the most I can say to you about career choices. You know, you're, you can have a plan, but plan to change, plan to evolve, plan to take in whatever you can from the jobs that you have at hand, right? So, when it comes to the fine arts, I did separate that and still separate that from graphic arts. Because for me, graphic arts has a purpose, it has a message to deliver, it it's, uh, can be propagandish, you know, it can do a lot of things. It has a purpose other than just freeing me to paint on the canvas. I can look at graphic arts or someone who's utilizing that in a fine arts field and appreciate their work. I don't appreciate it coming from me. And, and I don't know how to explain why I see that difference, but it's, when I go to a canvas, I want to be totally free to express myself. I don't want to plan. Part of that, I believe, comes from the fact that I work for government uh, for 30 years and I have to plan, I have to strategize, I have to make it reach a goal. Um, so my daytime, I'm in this sort of structured, very structured lifestyle. So when I go back to my canvas, I don't want to do that. I want to stand there. I don't want to pick colors. I don't want to decide which ones I'm going to use. I, I totally go there and I, I can proudly say that I have the messiest, probably, paint room of any artist I know. I happily don't put the tube tops back on the coat, and I know that's a bad thing, you know. Um, I can also maybe afford to do that because of the job that I have that pays for my canvases and pays for my tools. I consider myself really lucky in that respect. So, um, when I, also when you come to my work, I don't really, I want you to enjoy the conversation with my work. You don't, you can interpret it however you want to interpret it. I might have had, in the case of this particular room, the space as something to reflect on. The way I do that, because I don't typically work in theme, I study, I watch videos, I read things, I had no clue what they were saying scientifically. It, I just absorb what I call absorbing like a sponge what I can. I'm not going to be able to tell you scientifically what you're seeing on these walls because that's not what it's meant to be. I came to the campus saying, what would it feel like if I was an explosion? What would it feel like if I was just floating through space? What's the difference between, you know, gas and plasma? How does that feel? Okay, so I don't want to try to repeat what the Hubble has done absolutely marvelously, right? And it was more about how do I interpret it as an artist. So what I learned in this process, because I consider it all a learning opportunity, 
is to get off of, out of my four or five inch wide paintbrush. You know, and I began using sponges in different color palettes than I had done in the past. That's what I got out of it. Um, plus, when I'm coming to the canvas that way, I don't even remember the process. I start, I end, I, because it doesn't have any intermittent sections that I'm goals I'm trying to reach, right? I'm just trying to come to the end of a canvas that says to me, I'm done. Now, uh, I don't know if that short, I was going to keep this pretty short because I was more interested in your questions and how I might be able to help you move forward in your career, whether it be totally in the fine arts or the graphic arts or you have any questions on the way I paint, because I can sort of talk about that, but I, I think if you're, I'd rather you walk up to the canvas, look at it, evaluate it, as though you know what I'm doing, and then ask me, because you've learned so much more than if I were to tell you exactly how I do that canvas. And frankly, I'm not going to remember exactly how I did it, because I'm doing it sort of in this intuitive process. So with that, I think I'll entertain some questions. I actually have one if you wouldn't mind. Now, most of, well, all of these are space-themed, and I don't know if anyone has ever tried a space-themed painting, especially with oil paint, but when you do it, and whenever you look at it, you layer a lot of paint. Do you ever, in your process, I mean, I know you've said you kind of have an intuitive process, but do you ever get to a point on any one of the paintings, or any one that's not shown, where you get you reach a block where you're layering, layering paint where you say, oh, I'm not sure how this looks. Uh, always. <laughs> I think that as um, I remember when I was doing representational work, I would get, I loved the underpainting better than the finished product. And I discovered that the underpainting was just fine because the underpainting had all that little work in it. Right? had all the energy lines that when you're doing a portrait, the way I was painting, it would become flat. I would lose all that energy, and, and I love energy on a canvas. Um, what I also learned was that if I'm dissatisfied with the work, someone, a wise person, gave me the idea that make a big change. Don't hold on to it. If, if you're not happy with the work, make a huge change. Take a big, huge coloring of across the top and then work with that, right? Take large paint brushes, don't take little teeny paint brushes. So yeah, absolutely, I continue to um, be dis, I don't want to say dissatisfied, but um, looking for the right spot to finish. And I have a lot of works in my studio that don't come out. They'll be painted over, they won't be donated, <laughs> they won't be sold, because they're not works that I would want to be out. And so I, the other thing I would caution all artists to do is to be selective in your journey. Um, I took a travel around the state of Florida to find out if I wanted to, which gallery I aspired to, right? And you go in there and you talk to the gallery director and you say, uh, I wasn't ready to go into those galleries at the time. But you still ask the questions, and they'll give you some answers about if you want to be in this gallery, then don't do that. And don't do that. They will tell you. And that's your choice. If you want to be in a different gallery, they'll say those two things are fine. You can go ahead and do those. So I think uh, you, need to, you need to look and do some research and keep an open mind with everything you're doing, including if you get stuck on a painting. Sometimes I would get stuck on a painting and I'd sit over there and I'd go, what the heck is that? Where did that come from? You know, it looks like, it looks like something I don't like, right? But yet it had some seed that it was planting in my head and I put it over there and a year later, that particular style or whatever was going on would show up in a large work and I'd go, ah, 
there it is. So even though you might get stuck or you might not know where you're going or what you're doing, just keep on moving. It can be challenging, but you know, if you love art, that's what you do. I don't think you have an alternative. You just keep painting or you just keep doing your sculpture work or mixed media work. Because it is, for me, it's my life. When I would come home and get frustrated, my husband would say, go paint, right? When I was frustrated, I knew where my safety place was, painting. When I was frustrated, some of that made my best work. So, at least from my perspective. Now, you've mentioned the challenges that you face as an artist with, you know, reaching those grid blocks. Someone from our questionnaire process asked this question, what are some of the things you enjoy about, specifically about the process that you go through? Specifically, I enjoy my process because of the freedom. I don't, like I, I mentioned before, I had to get over caring if the canvas cost up to $200, $100. I had to get over caring about if the paint cost so much. I had to get over whether someone was going to like it or not. And so I did that, you know. And when I was doing some fairs, I remember I had some works up there. They weren't quite as, um, they were still using a lot of figurative work and some people would walk in and they'd say, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I'd go, because they were fairly psychological paintings. And I'd say, well, no, I guess my question would be, what's wrong with you? Because these works are just perfectly fine for me. And they would turn out, uh, that they were a blue, what I call a blue person versus a brown person. These, these paintings happen to be in brown. Um, so, but that didn't, that kept me going forward because I love that conversation. I don't want everyone to walk into the space and say, oh, I love your work. I want them to be able to talk about the work in a, in a deeper, more meaningful way, right? I, I'm not there to decorate your couch. You know, even though I do have some people that have them over their couches, right? But that isn't my first process. My first thing is what am I trying to get out and just let it come out in whatever poetic way it can be. Yeah. Um, whenever you're painting, do you like, like, whenever you're finished with it, is it just like you all of a sudden look back and you're like, well, this looks done? Or like, is it just like a feeling you get? How do yes. you know when you're done? Like, a absolutely. And there's sometimes, uh, you know, it's it's very hard for me to maintain a simple palette. Very hard for me to do that. These, I force myself to stick with just the black and white. Um, there can be a line missing. Something as simple as a single line that wouldn't matter to y'all would probably not know it. Right? But I'm going to walk up and I won't hang it because I know something's not right in that work. And I will wait until that one line. Uh, every once in a while I'll hang them in advance of having that gut that says it's really done so that I can see it out on the wall and determine what it is that needs to be done for it. But if I can't figure it out, then it won't ever see the light of day again. Yeah. Do you have um, artists that you find inspire you the most and or influence your work the most? And if you do, who are those artists be? No, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I, I think it's really, really important that, and that's why I gave that sheet of paper out. I think it's, for my journey anyway, I found it extremely important to read. I read books that don't have pictures in them, folks. They're art theory books. Okay? I, it's, like, it's like that science project I just said. I read all, all about science, right? And then I began to paint. I didn't go back and look at the stuff I read or looked at. I just started to paint. And I look at art history over time um, as a really rich, why did the artist do what they did, right? And the, the one that comes to mind most for me is probably Willem de Kuhn. At one time it was, 
And I'm not talking about his personal life, folks. I'm talking about the spirit of the painter. Okay? Spirit of the painter. Um, the, you know, I was a Rembrandt fan. I was a Michelangelo fan because I loved the figure. And one day, in my struggles to achieve what these other artists have done, I said, you know, look, they did it. You don't need to do that. You need to do Margaret. Okay? And that was a big awakening for me. There's a difference between absorbing who they are as a, as a spirit, as a soul artist, right? And the way they paint. And so what I do is I strictly just read. I don't have any that I would say I try to paint like or because I think they all have value on that sheet of paper. I also said that, you know, whether you like it or you don't like it, there's something to be learned from that painting. And it's not that you won't, it can be that you won't ever paint like that. But if you look deep into the painting, there's some pieces and parts in that that you will want to maybe put in your toolbox and use it to recreate who you are. Okay, so today I don't paint with anybody or anything in mind, and I found that freedom is the most wonderful thing I could probably ever do for myself. And I would encourage all of y'all to try to find that if you haven't. slideshow so you could see some of that. Um, and I began to fracture the figure um, in space. You know, so I've always worked with what I, real depth in a painting. I don't work the flat, uh, a flat surface with like a lot of contemporary work is today. I, I enjoy that depth. So the answer is no, I don't plan. Years ago when I was doing uh, landscapes and portraits, certainly there was a in that process. In your middle works in the other room, like, well, what's the, what's your, your, like the tower, what's your main inspiration for that form piece? Okay, um, those works actually, that is the, the metal works uh, came out of just something one day that said, I have to create a metal structure that these paintings can go in. And you would hear people say, take the, take the, cam the paint off the canvas, right, or, over the years. I still am a painter on canvas, so I had to come up with some sort of structure that made sense to me. Now, that just grew out sort of like a painting does. I started with a structure, and, and screwed, it's very fast, screwed some canvas in it that I had already painted, Actually, that, a lot of that painting, I set it outside. I used really old, nasty stuff, poured it all over it. You'll see little animal feet walking through it if you look real close. Um, but I found a tool also that could pop the, that angle iron. So when I'm working, I go, I snap, snap, bolt, bolt, drill, drill. Then I go, oh, I want one this long. Snap, pop it. And that's the only way I would do a structure like that is if I can work as fast as I'm thinking versus making a plan. So that has basically no plan either, except for when it leaned, I had to do something different to make it stabilize. Right. Yeah. Do you ever find when you're doing a piece like you say you limited yourself to the black and white over on that wall, or when you're um, doing a painting that, do you find You know, I can't say that I would not do that, but I don't. Um, you know, everything's available to the future. But I don't think you can ever get the same energy and stroke 
when you're trying to do it. That's it. I will say that these two, I did come back with sort of a slat. I, I draw really small like this. And so I'll doodle the rest of these. But with those, I said, let me try and see what I feel about blending a preliminary sort of sketch with a final product. There's a figure in the other room, uh, the theorist, similar. They never turn out like the sketch sort of a thought process. I don't blow it up and put it on the canvas. This one does have a little bit of pencil, you know, marking so I could sort of, because I was trying to make them so where I could put them together or separate them as I've done here. Right. Um, those just happen to be a delivery on, are we going to freeze or are we going to burn? That's why those colors were chosen. is when people see abstract work, they say, I could do that, or they say, my kid could do that. The famous. The famous, always, <laughs> I could do that, right? How do you personally respond to that, if you've encountered it, or how would you respond to that? If you've well, uh, first let me explain. My figurative work, if you go out to the website, you'll see some of the figurative work. It's really very abstract. Um, I don't have any of my old landscapes or portraits out there. That's not what I do. There's some people that still have want to have me do something, um, I will, but only under the right conditions. Uh, so they tend to not, we tend to not do that. But, uh, so you won't go out there and see those realistic works. The, so back to your question on anybody can do that. I think probably when I was in college and I went to all those museums, there were times when I would look at that work and I'd go, mm -hmm. And I remember the most uh, interesting one was a purple sponge hanging in an acrylic box called saturated purple, you know. And I went and I'm like, huh? What is that, you know? And then I went to another and I saw a gorgeous representational work and I go over there and they stuck pig noses in it, right? And I go, huh? You know, so, I, I, you know, I think when it comes to someone who says, like, anyone can do that, they don't know it well enough to know different. Because abstract work is not easy to do for the exact reason that you were talking about. When is it done? If I paint a portrait, I know when it's done. Right? Uh, if you're working in this, it's sort of a feeling and a balance. Someone can look at a portrait and say, it looks like that person and say, they say you're either good or you're bad at that representation. In these, they have to figure out whether they like it, what's it doing for them emotionally, they have to open up their eyes and, in a different way. And even I have to. I've only been painting in an abstract methodology for about 15 years now. And what happened, I'll have to share this with you, is that when I was in junior college and at the University of Florida, I was drawing these little sketches of figures in boxes. Little teeny sketches with little lines all over them. Didn't know what they were, but they comforted me wherever I, I could draw those anywhere. I could draw them on a napkin, brown paper bag, anything. And so that's the other thing I hope that y'all are doing is that you sketch, sketch, sketch all the time. Don't just, if you're on a computer, don't be on a computer all the time. Sketch, sketch, sketch. It will make your life richer. It will make your work richer. But I would just say basically that uh, people who don't understand, they just don't understand abstract art, that's all, or they would be able to tell the difference. I know when I think someone's a great abstract work and when someone is just playing at it. Do you want to? I do. 
You do want to. One of the tips that was given to me, because I had been doing these little sketches, right, I felt unfulfilled by representational work. I took an advanced study course with someone for a week and where you just go in and they mentor you to push you wherever you want to go. That's 15 years ago now. And he saw these little sketches and he says, make those large and make those yours. Now, he knew that I had been trucking around doing these little sketches all my life, but I had never made one into a painting. So then I made one into a painting just like I had drawn it, right? Very loose. So what my tip for you to do is get yourself a big, huge piece of paper, a large wall space, put it out there, get five-inch paint brushes, and do what you're doing with your tight little works and just let it fly. Because remember, it's about your process. It's not about selling it. You know, and that was the other thing, is I got over trying to sell everything. It didn't make me happy, but you know, that goes back to, I have this other career that supported me being able to do what I want, right? Which was also very creative because I chose to make it so. Um, so just, you know, don't get so serious. Get something that you don't care about if you get messy. Use old paint, get house paint, you know? And uh, you may end up selling that. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. So. Anybody else? I just want to give a quick message to our Periscope viewers. In case you are in the Niceville area, you can always view these works and even the ones that Margaret didn't mention from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Monday through Fridays at the Mighty Kelly Art Center. Thanks for viewing. Great intro on that. What? Yeah, you got to follow.